Our speakers today are Megan Carr and Damian Ossie. Megan is uh, originally from South Texas, and she developed a fascination with the relationships between people and their environments, and also a passion for native plant conservation when she was working in a completely different state in Hawaii as a field technician. She's called Maryland home for most of the last 10 years. She received her bachelor's degree in ethnobotany at Frostburg State University, which is in Western Maryland, followed by a master's in environmental science at the Yale School of the Environment. She serves on the Maryland Invasive Species Council, the Maryland Urban and Community Forest Committee, and the board of directors for the Maryland Forestry Foundation. Since 2020, she has been working as part of the Natural Areas Unit at Baltimore City's Forestry Division, where she assists with the management of forested natural areas and the coordination of the Baltimore City Weed Warriors Program, which is a great program. Damien is a Maryland native raised in Tacoma Park and living in Greenbelt. He is a jack of all trades wildlife biologist with the District of Columbia Department of Energy and Environment. He studies rare dragonflies and butterflies in urban habitats and also leads DC's invasive plant management efforts. He is currently working on projects that would expand native grassland meadows and restore tidal wetlands and has drafted laws and regs to restrict invasive species and protect endangered species. He's the founder of the National Capital Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, the National Capital PRISM, and is currently the chair of its steering committee. In Greenbelt, he is a member and former co-chair of the city's Forest Preser uh, Preserve Advisory Board and a founding member of the Greenbelt Biota Nature Club. Damien enjoys hiking with his two teenage sons and carving spoons and other trees from Greenwood. Thank you for coming here to tell us all about Invader Detectives. Great. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, I believe uh, Damien is going to lead us off here, but excited to be here and really appreciate the invitation and warm welcome. So thanks for inviting us to come and talk about this this uh, this new program that we've both started up. Um, as Judy said, my name is Damien Asi, and I work for the District of Columbia Department of Energy and Environment in the Fisheries and Wildlife Division. Um, I like to say it's not just uh, rats and squirrels and pigeons in DC. We do have a lot of uh, interesting wildlife and natural areas in the district. Um, and a big part of my job <clears throat> has been trying to work on partnerships and create uh, partnerships within the district and then also within the region to, to manage invasive plants and then invasive species. Um, so we're now uh, have this organization that we call the National Capital Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. Uh, so the acronym is PRISM. Uh, and this is just a, 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 the slide shows you a map of the area. So it's the District of Columbia and pretty much all the surrounding, uh, the surrounding jurisdictions in both Montgomery, in both Maryland and Virginia. So we are a, a multi-state and multi-county, multi-jurisdiction partnership. Uh, we have a mission to protect biodiversity uh, and, and, and by minimizing the impacts of invasive species. So we have a very simple mission uh, and with a focus on early detection, rapid response. Uh, and this is just a slide that also shows a number, but not all of the members uh, of the, or partners within the PRISM. Uh, and some of the things that we do, uh, much like a lot of invasive plant organizations, we do volunteer events, but we actually are, uh, we're the kind of an umbrella organization <clears throat> that organizes larger volunteer events. So for instance, we had a, a an umbrella event on National Public Lands Day a few years ago, and we had something like 26 events with 12 different partners all throughout the region. Uh, we also do regional weed warrior trainings. So uh, trying to 
expand the use of the Weed Warrior program and the Weed Warrior type training beyond just individual partners and trying to get multiple partners involved in both the training aspect and the uh, implementation of Weed Warrior programs. Uh, and then one of our projects, this is kind of one of the ones that I'm most proud of, is we put on professional uh, training workshops uh, for so for people who do who do land management professionally. Um, and these are free. It's an all day workshop. We've been doing them almost 10 years now. I think we started in 2020, 2014. We actually may have just had our 10th one this last year. Um, but they're, they're, we put them on annually. We have these hands-on events, uh, have lots of expertise, local expertise come and teach the classes. Uh, and we also offer recertification for pesticide applicators from four different states. Uh, and then one other thing that we've been doing is these invasive species alerts. Uh, you may have seen these come through on your social media. Uh, we put together uh, just a few of them recently um, the most, probably the most interesting, I think, is the Cuban tree frog, which showed up around here uh, in house plants that were shipped from Florida uh, or, or other southern states, um, and where they're they're pretty much uh, well established in Florida, um, but they get into the house plants, and then during COVID, a lot of people took up uh, taking care of house plants in their house. Uh, and buying new house plants. And so we got a whole lot of reports of Cuban tree frogs. So we did a response to those. We're currently working on a, a response and preparing for spotted lantern fly. Uh, it's definitely in the prism, but it has uh, not really gotten into the District of Columbia yet uh, to any great extent. Um, and then this water chestnut, which is a new species that was discovered about five or six years ago, and it's really spread um, throughout uh, some ponds in Northern Virginia, and then was just recently discovered in a pond um, just really close to where I live. It's in Beltsville Agricultural Research Center. So that's one that uh, we've actually started a regional task force separate from the prism to address this uh, Trapa bispinosa, which is a new species that was found. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the, the main gist of the, the work that we do. Just to give a little bit of background about uh, our organization and the scale that we're working at. Uh, so Baltimore City, for those who aren't uh, familiar with the governance structure, we are considered our own county separate from uh, the geographically larger and adjacent Baltimore County. So sometimes you'll see Baltimore City County on forms if that helps things make sense. Uh, within city government, the Natural Areas Unit is a team within the Forestry Division, which is part of the Department of Recreation and Parks. So the Forestry Division also manages things like street trees and trees within managed park areas, as well as running the Camp Smallwood Reutilization Program. And the Natural Areas Unit currently consists of two full-time employees uh, to oversee around 1,800 acres of forested natural areas on BCRP properties citywide. So we do work closely with our colleagues on other teams and within other units uh, throughout BCRP and with other partners throughout the city. Uh, and we also oversee contracts for this work, but we do rely heavily on volunteer stewards. So a big part of that, of course, is uh, forest management plans. Um, you know, we have our forest management plans for, uh, currently we just have one for Gwynns Falls Leakin Park, which is the uh, largest forested area within Baltimore City. It's one of the largest forested natural areas in a, in a city uh, in the U.S. Um, so, of course, we started there. The natural areas in uh, Gwynns Falls Leakin Park constitute about half of that 1,800 acres of forested natural areas on our properties. So it made sense to start there. And we had our uh, forest management plan for that area published in uh, October of 2017. Uh, through a contract with biohabitats. But we are looking uh, at scaling up our activities. So we are currently working with Strawn Environmental, who is, uh, they have all of the field data collected from the last couple of seasons and are currently processing and writing up recommendations for our next three largest parks, which are Silburn Arboretum, Druid Hill Park, and Herring Run Park. Uh, we will also have some uh, natural resource inventories. So we'll have some data gathered from a number of our smaller parks as well. 
And of course, where would we be without our weed warriors? So uh, like many weed warriors programs, uh, we are of course modeled after the excellent uh, program started in Montgomery County. Uh, and we've since adapted over the last few years to best fit our needs and the needs of our volunteers. So we offer training and support for volunteer stewards that are interested in removing non-native invasive species uh, and provide certification to provide folks with permission uh, to work independently or to lead events on BCRP properties and natural areas. But we absolutely welcome folks to attend uh, from anywhere throughout the area. We do get a lot of participation from folks that live uh, on the county side. And we welcome anyone to come and learn with us uh, and apply the skills that they gain um, anywhere that they have permission to work. So we'll talk more going forward about uh, some of the things that they do for us. It's not just pulling vines. A lot of it is uh, being our eyes and ears with the amount of space that we need to cover and the staffing limitations that we have. Uh, it is crucial to have more people out there on our behalf, uh, helping us to be more effective. And you know why we do all of this. So this kind of scenery may be familiar to many, um, especially in urbanized areas. So while there are some significant differences in the plant communities between you know, Baltimore and the greater DC area, we absolutely share a lot of the same issues. Uh, kudzu, other invasive vines, especially when coupled with white-tailed deer, seriously impede regeneration of tree species. And of course, things like incursion by emerald ash borer over the last decade severely affected the canopy of many of our forest stands, which then of course opens up opportunities for non-native invasive plants to come in and again, throw a wrench in the works of what the natural regeneration patterns would look like. So for a great example of this, uh, you know, we have uh, a series of photos that speak for themselves. Uh, you know, we can see this floodplain from a photo taken in the 70s in Rock Creek Park uh, as compared to a more recent image of a similar habitat also in Rock Creek Park where the spring beauties have been almost entirely displaced by lesser celandine. Um, it's certainly a species that we also deal with uh, you know, throughout floodplains up in Baltimore City as well. So in short, you know, I don't think that we need to uh, spend a ton of time in this particular crowd uh, advocating for the necessity of controlling non-native invasive species. Uh, we all are pretty well familiar with the impacts, um, but in brief, you know, it's a bottom-up series of effects uh, and a, a domino effect on an uh, ecosystem's ability to support native wildlife and to provide all of the ecological services that we and other creatures rely on our native ecosystems for. And these issues, of course, are amplified in urban areas. So more people means more development and human activity on the landscape has a tendency to break continuous landscapes up into smaller and smaller pieces. So of course, in our region, we're defaulting to talking about forest cover as that's the majority of the landscape that would have been were it not interrupted by development. Uh, and so, you know, the development patterns have produced in our cities are smaller and smaller pieces of increasingly fragmented forests. So thinking of this in terms of surface area ratio, that means we end up with a lot more edge habitat. And with humans, of course, also comes disturbance. We're really good at that. Fires, construction, other means of moving soils around and uh, interrupting vegetation communities, plus all of our usual activities that can introduce novel species to new areas like ornamental landscaping, accidental introductions from dumping, seeds stuck to your dog um, or your boots, all of the above. So that leaves us with a combination of factors that all favor non-native invasive species. They tend to be very well adapted for edge habitats, uh, for disturbed areas. And then of course, we're also providing the means for introduction. So these things are going to happen anywhere you find people, including very rural areas, but in cities, it's especially concentrated, which is why urban areas in particular are subject to especially high invasive species pressure. So more often than not, we find ourselves playing catch up and trying to deal with issues once they're already incredibly difficult to manage. So our response to this is trying to reframe and think more about early detection and rapid response. Um, if we throw around the acronym EDRR, that's what we're going to be referring to going forward. So many of you are probably familiar with the invasion curve model. 
Um, effectively, you're looking at time on your x-axis here and both the area infested by a particular invasive species introduced to a given area and uh, management costs, of course, also track along with the area that a species is occupying. So the best time to intervene uh, when a species is introduced is before it's introduced. You know, when, when you are able to prevent, uh, it's maybe not a zero management cost issue because you absolutely need inspectors and investment in resources to prevent eradication, but you know, it is much easier at that stage. Uh, as an, in an introduced species proceeds, the um, population will accumulate over time um, and gradually eradication, uh, you know, the potential to get that species fully removed from a given area goes from being simple or possible to unlikely and then nearly impossible. And this is what that pattern typically looks like. Um, you know, it often takes a little while for a species to be in the landscape before we pick up on it. Um, and then public awareness frequently doesn't kick in until things have really gotten under control. And that's what generates the political will uh, for management of that species at the point when eradication is already unlikely. And so what we're advocating for and what our programs are trying to manage more in the direction of is to shift those arrows back over a little bit, well, more than a little bit. We want to shift them over as far as feasible to make it uh, more possible for us to detect species, to make the public aware of them, and to uh, generate the will to manage for these species and reduce their impacts overall. And I'll turn it over to Damien to talk about how the Invader Detectives program works into that. All right, thank you, Megan. Um, so what we're going to go into now is a way to uh, to really start uh, getting a lot more people into the dead detection part of that uh, EDRR curve. Uh, and to do that, we're using that we have this program that we call Invader Detectives. Um, and throughout the uh, uh, most of the rest of this talk, we're going to use this little flow chart uh, to talk about the the, the Invader Detectives program. Um, and one of the big parts of it is training. So wherever you see the, the red uh, box around one of the, 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 the red outline around one of the boxes on this flow chart, that's where we are in the flow chart. Um, so right now you're all, you're all are here and you're going to get trained to be invader detectives uh, in the next uh, 30 or 30 minutes or so. Um, so what is invader detectives? So I'm going to go into a little of the background of where the program came from and how we've started implementing it. Um, so it was created by Mark Frey, who used to work for the National Park Service here in the National Capital Region, um, but he was doing a detail at the National Invasive Species Council. Um, and his and during his detail there, one of his projects was to come up with a way to use federal data uh, from, from a number of federal databases to find uh, new species that are have just been input into that data. So brand new species that hadn't been found yet. Uh, typically, these are going to be non-native species because these databases are massive and they already contain quite a bit of information about um, all of the, the native plants and all of the common invasive plants. You, know, you, you would imagine that English ivy would have been uh, would have been input into a number of federal federal databases uh, throughout, uh, throughout the last uh, 100 years or so, uh, or even using, using old data in herbaria and stuff like that. Uh, one of the large, one of the, the biggest was a, is a database called Bison, B-I-S-O-N, which is the Department of the, Interior, uh, the, Department of the Interior's uh, overall database where, where most of their data gets input into. Um, and then what, what they did was take all those data and use a program created by someone at the Smithsonian to, uh, to extract these interesting species that are, that are just novel to the databases. Uh, and that was, <clears throat> that's a process called, uh, sometimes called horizon scanning. Um, and so that created our initial list of species that we were interested in in the national capital region. Um, and you might see here on this little map that it, it looks larger than the map of the 
Prism, and that's because we also uh, incorporate a lot of the data for the all the all the national parks in the national capital region because the Park Service is a member of the Prism. Um, so we took that that project <clears throat> and as a, at the Prism, and we tried to start implementing it. Uh, it turned out really quickly that it's difficult for us to access the federal data, and the Smithsonian was uh, not able to maintain. Uh, their program that would extract that data. So we had to turn towards other um, other methods to to use uh, to acquire the data and to do the the actual uh, on the ground work of, of finding and reporting species. Um, and luckily, we have this amazing app and website called iNaturalist. And so we were able to pivot pretty easily to using iNaturalist and citizen sciences or com community science. Uh, scientists to assist with uh, with collecting the data, um, and then we also are also able to use it uh, specifically so that the parks and the land managers in the prism can respond and respond rapidly to new reports. Um, and then we're also looking at ways to do the actual horizon scanning within iNaturalist. There's ways to manipulate the uh, the filters in the search field and the actual URL so that you can find uh, novel species, either very rare natives or the, 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 the species that you as a user is, is fairly unique to you compared to other users or uh, species that are fairly unique to a given region. And so using those tools, we can accomplish some of the horizon scanning. Uh, and so that's what we have done uh, and we have implemented this uh, project page in iNaturalist. Um, and what we have is using the, the original uh, species list from the National Invasive Species Council, and then also speaking with uh, experts and members of the PRISM, we've come, we have created a list of 84 species that are our target early detection rapid response species. Um, <clears throat> And looking at this, you might see that the very first one is Japanese barberry. And you might say, well, that's everywhere. That's not an early detection species. And you'd be right about that. But there's a number of other Berberis um, that uh, people may mistake for Japanese barberry. And so we've we've put in a number of species, uh, approximately 20, 20 extra species that are usually lookalikes or somehow mistaken for some of our target species. Uh, another good example is Oregon grape, which is a native lookalike of, well, it's native to um, west of the Rockies, I think. And um, it's a lookalike to leatherleaf mahonia. I think it's, it's in the same genus and it looks very similar. And so sometimes people will put leather, uh, Oregon grape as the ID for a leatherleaf mahonia. Um, and so because we have these issues, because this is not a, a database, uh, like a federal database where there is uh, oversight or there's expertise that goes into um, making sure that the data is accurate within the database, part of our invader detectives program is working with uh, some invader detectives who do not actually go out into the field. We've trained them to curate our, our entries. And so someone will be assigned uh, a species, and they'll be the ones who go through. And uh, initially, they went through and looked at all of the entries that were already in the day in the in iNaturalist when we set up the program, because this pulls the entire history of iNaturalist. So it's not just uh, the the this stuff that was being added three years ago. It's everything that had been put into iNaturalist since the beginning. Um, and so we need to go through and curate those. Uh, and so we have. Uh, a whole bunch of people who are doing the curation. We've got curated about a third of the uh, of the observations that are in the project, uh, and then that that six thousand citizen science scientists. That's pretty much that's pretty much all the observers. Uh, they're not all invader detectives. They're just all users of iNaturalist who have happened to put in a species that we are interested in. Uh, and so what we have uh, ultimately accomplished is we've done a number of trainings, 21 trainings. Uh, no, it's a lot more than that. We've done a, a, quite a few trainings um, and we've created a, a core, a core of, uh, I want to use core in both terms, 
C-O-R-E and C-O-R-P-S uh, of people who have um, who have actually become invader detectives and they're out in the field uh, looking for species. Uh, they're they're on a listserv that we put together, and we will occasionally uh, seasonally in the, give them uh, suggestions on what species they should go look for, and um, and where they should go look for those species. And we've had uh, we've had enough trainings that we've trained well over a thousand people at this point. And then we've also done some walks and some field events, and I think we've done about twenty or twenty five of those now. Yeah, so this is just a, uh, to kind of compare and contrast. Uh, so our early detection rapid response tracking project is similarly uh, set up in iNaturalist to filter for observations of a set of species or taxa that we're interested in taking a look at. So uh, we have 69 taxa that we're currently tracking. Uh, and some of that is for reasons that Damien was identifying with, uh, you know, the uh, misidentifications or things being, uh, you know, having native lookalikes. So, uh, of course, uh, you know, the Japanese angelica tree is a big one for that with uh, its strong similarity to the native devil's walking stick. Um, in those cases, uh, sometimes it's easier to just set things at the genus level. And, uh, you know, that way you can go through and Compare and contrast and correct when you find uh, a misidentified species, something that's tagged as a native, but is the invasive or vice versa. Um, unfortunately, it's usually the, the former um, that we encounter, but, uh, you know, and not all of our species are things that we are actively controlling. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, um, but certainly things that we want to keep on the radar and make sure that we're staying informed on as land managers. Okay, so now we're going to get into how do you become an invader detective and how do you actually use iNaturalist to do that. Um, so the first thing you need to do is get iNaturalist on your phone. Uh, and I'm guessing that most of you already have it on your phone because you like to go out and look at plants and maybe look at other things that are crawling on the plants or growing next to the plants or things like that. So uh, in iNaturalist, you can put it on your phone, both Android and iPhone, um, and then you can make an account. And then all you need to do is open the app up and go find a target species. This time of year, a leatherleaf mahonia might be a good one, and take a picture of it and make a report. Um, so step one, and step one is probably the most difficult because you need to actually deal with putting the app on your phone. Um, but then step two, it's fairly, uh, fairly easy. Uh, so when you're making a report, we have some tips for actually, uh, for actually making a, a report that's going to be useful and it's the best report possible. Um, we like for multiple photographs, so you can show the whole plant, you can show the whole infestation, and then zoom in on the plant or get close enough to the plant that there's good identifying features. Um, so, for example, if you see a patch of wavy leaf basket grass, you want to take a picture of the entire uh, patch, and then you want to get close enough so that you can see uh, you can see the the wavy leaves. And then, if their seeds are there, you want to get close enough to see the seeds. Um, don't touch them because they'll stick to you, and then you'll spread it around. Um, and then it's also uh, useful and helpful to leave a field note. So there's a field in the app where you can type in. Uh, anything that you notice about the plant or um, or or uh, or like something about the location or how large the the infestation you think it is either in square feet or acres or you know one or two individuals uh, and uh, things like that uh, and then an important thing is to note uh, it the app defaults to it not being a cultivated plant uh, and I think that's great because the whole point of iNaturalist is get out there and look at interesting things and to get people to 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 look at the biodiversity in their area. Um, but a lot of times for our uh, for for the species that we're looking at, many times they are species that are common in the horticultural trade, commonly planted. Um, for instance, uh, I think Farragut Square downtown has. Uh, black fountain grass 
uh, planted in the formal landscaping in a national park managed property. Um, so that one would be one that we're interested in, but it would you would want to market cultivated. Uh, and what happens when you market cultivated is that in iNaturalist, it no longer, it's marked as casual and not research grade. Uh, so uh, that also goes for things like if you see a cheetah at the National Zoo, um, pretty much there's a whole lot of entries for the National Zoo. If you zoom in on iNaturalist, there everything's just casual grade because there are very few things there that are uh, <laughs> that are reported that aren't from somewhere else in the world. Oh, and then you just click the share button, and um, your report goes up. Okay, and then, so what happens once you put in a report? Uh, the next step is verification. And so that's something that we do, uh, be both people, members of the PRISM, and then some invader detectives do it as well. So that's, I described it a little bit earlier, but you know, you, you put in a report and it will show up almost immediately on iNaturalist. And uh, once a week or, or you know, in, in slow, slow times of the year, once a week, and then when we're busy, maybe once a month, the curator will get on and go through the species that they that have been, uh, go through the new observations for the species that they are assigned, and they'll go through and verify them. Uh, and typically that involves uh, just looking at it, and if it's already been uh, if enough observations, uh, people have already suggested the correct ID, it's pretty easy to identify it. Um, if we think it's something else, you can leave a comment with the, with the person. Uh, if you're not sure of the location or if you want a description, we'll often write in uh, a comment like the one here that Sarah had put in, uh, telling her that we're adding this to our project or this, this entry was automatically added to the project. And it's something that uh, we're interested in and the landowners are interested in. And, um, and then uh, that the land manager might actually come and do something about this report. So that is, uh, it's one of the great things about iNaturalist in general is the social aspect of it. Uh, and so we're making use of that social aspect uh, in our verification process. Um, and then <clears throat> hopefully, and our goal is to get the parks to respond or the landowners to respond when we get a report of something novel. Um, and so one of the things, that's one of the things we do is we go out to our, uh, all of our partners when we get an interesting report, we let them know about it. Um, and so, so far we've, uh, at the time of putting together this slideshow originally, which I think was in the summer, uh, we haven't really updated these numbers yet, uh, but we had 55 notifications of isolated populations of species that we were interested in. So this would be something like uh, five-leaf akebia, uh, chocolate vine, found growing in Sligo Creek Park. Uh, and if you look at the um, if you look at the map on iNaturalist, it's maybe a mile away from the nearest other entry. So that's an isolated population, something that we we're interested in, um, <clears throat> and that gets to like interesting questions of scale when it comes to what is an early detection rapid response species. Uh, and, you know, it, it may be something that's common in the area, but it hasn't yet been found in this specific park. Um, so we want to, in that, in that uh, instance, this is an early detection species, and we want to respond rapidly to that species in that park uh, because we haven't seen it there yet. Um, and so, so far we've gotten... Um, We've gotten 35 uh, management responses from the parks where we reported these uh, these species, and then 18 of those are still pending. Uh, and so here's a great case study. This is uh, Jap uh, this is incise fumort Caridalis incisa, and this was a species that was probably uh, first reported in the area uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, there was a big study was found in uh, the, by New York Botanical Garden, growing along um, I think the Bronx River, and they were you know they they did a, a number of papers about this species and how much they were finding it in riparian areas and, and how much it was spreading, um, and so this is a tar one of our target species that we're looking for. It's a it's a species that's it's in the buttercup family, 
and it grows in habitats that are very similar to lesser salandine. It grows in the floodplain. It does seem to grow in slightly higher elevations or slightly sandier soils than lesser salandine. So it, uh, we found that it competes almost directly uh, with, uh, with the Virginia bluebells in places where that's it's dominant. Um, so here, these are some Virginia bluebells. I think it's the Four Mile Run Park um, or Hemlock, Hemlock Overlook Park in, uh, in Arlington County. Uh, and so we got some reports uh, on, we noticed some reports on iNaturalist and these were new users, fairly new users, and we contacted them. Um, and these are folks that who, who walk, walk this park daily uh, and they have noticed over the last couple of years, this interesting plant come in and start to actually kill off uh, the, the bluebells. They start to actually, it's starting to actually in areas where bluebells used to dominate. And so that was pretty interesting uh, phenomenon. And, you know, we could tell from their reports that this was, uh, this was incised fumort. And so we wanted, we wanted to get out there and respond to them uh, and help them deal with it. Uh, and this was a park that is managed by Nova Parks, so it's not necessarily a member or wasn't necessarily a member of the PRISM. Um, as, you know, they're an organization that is separate both from, they're in Fairfax County and uh, Arlington County, but they're not, uh, not an org, it's not, they're not parks that are run by county government. Um, so we went out there with the, the land manager and kind of rapidly trained him up to be able to, he wasn't a plant guy, but we got out there and trained him up to be able to identify uh, the Corydalus incisa and the, 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 the incised fumort. And uh, he already knew the bluebells really well because he'd been out there a whole lot. Uh, and then we tested a couple of management techniques, uh, both using just uh, mechanical removal and chemical control in this, in this area. And I think the chemical control was both um, petroleum-based products like glyphosate, uh, we use some of those. And then also looking at, can we use the, uh, the horticultural vinegar and would that be effective in killing off this species? Um, so a little bit of experimentation is to see which would, which would work on these. Um, but the best part about this project is that we, you know, we got a, a random report from, from people who weren't even invader detectives and typically didn't use this, uh, this app but it was something that they noticed and we were able to get out there, assess the size of the population. Uh, and we, I think we have some good new information about uh, where this species is showing up and that it's really gonna have an, it could have an impact on bluebells, um, uh, which is I think a little bit different from uh, the impacts that lesser celandine has had on bluebells. Uh, and so, I put together a couple of slides just to show the, the changes in you know, how effective invader detectives had been over the last year. Uh, so I pulled this uh, map from our invader detectives project uh, around this time last year. So I think this was in December, mid-December or late December of 2022. Uh, and you can see there's 285 observations of this one species in within our uh, within our prism area, so this it might be limited by a boundary that you can't see, but this is within the the project area for uh, for the prism. Um, and then by the end of May, I think this was the end of May, close to the end of April, we had 604 observations. So over the course of approximately three months, we went from 285 to 604 observations. And that is pretty much all due to uh, invader detectives, people who have been trained to go out and look for it, uh, participating in our project and uh, you know, either going out and looking for it in new places or going out and adding new reports in places where it had been found, trying to find new populations close to where other populations had been found and also trying to get a handle on how large some of these populations are. Um, and we actually got some really interesting uh, information, especially up in northern and western Montgomery County, I think uh, Seneca Creek area. There's some very large populations of this species along the floodplain up there. Um, 
So it's really, really good information. And just the fact that this was a species that we went basically with our invader detectives and within our listserv, we told, we've told everyone, okay, go out and look for this species. It's going to be flowering for the next four weeks. Um, and, you know, and we were able to really increase the amount of information we had about this species. For a couple of examples for how we're utilizing this information up in Baltimore, um, we wanted to share just a couple of of examples of things that we're doing with the data that our volunteers have been gathering. So one success story is that uh, we are staying on top of, you know, containing the population of Japanese Angelica in Baltimore City. Unfortunately, there's quite a bit inside the zoo. Uh, and while we are, we have a pretty good working relationship with our, our zoo uh, neighbors, but uh, gaining access and being able to perform treatments within that property is challenging. So that will be an ongoing process. But in the meantime, we're able to keep things kind of reined in. And we had been treating one particular stand of Japanese Angelica in Herring Run Park, which is in Northeast Baltimore. If you see the one green dot kind of out there um, on the, the far extent, that's around where this population was found. Um, so, and the population question here, so less than a mile from the population that we had been treating, there was a stand that we just didn't know about. Uh, it wasn't too far away, it was actually right off a trail, uh, just we hadn't happened to have someone from our team walk by and notice it. Um, luckily though, uh, one of our volunteers who is actually now uh, on BCRP staff, and we're very excited for that, uh, he happened to, to make note and reported this population to us. We were able to get our contractor dispatched and uh, I think it may still entail a couple more rounds of treatment. Uh, this particular stand has been a little resistant. It's right on uh, the Herring Run stream. So you're know, needing to take extra care with uh, you know, herbicide applications um, has certainly led to additional challenges. But we've had some success already and we'll reassess it uh, this next year and see what the population is doing. But the good news is that we won't be starting with having mature individuals uh, standing there and producing a ton of fruits for birds to then disperse throughout the forests. So we're hopeful that we were able to get to this stand within the first few years. None of them had a particularly large diameter on the trunk, so they were fairly young. It's a fast growing species uh, and we'll continue to monitor for this one and uh, try to shrink the population in a bit. Uh, so these reports can be very directly applied to our management decisions, um, but sometimes they can just inform uh, how we're approaching some of these species. So wintergreen barberry is one that is kind of on our radar. Uh, there's not a great deal of data out there as to uh, its invasive tendencies that I've turned up so far, but given uh, that it has close relatives that are extremely invasive, and having seen a handful of individuals naturalize, uh, it's something that we decided to flag and keep tabs on. So if we start noting um, an increased spread, then that would indicate to us that we need to be more aggressive and start targeting the species in particular. Um, a number of the observations for this particular species uh, were cultivated. Uh, it is a really commonly planted species for hedges. So that's not terribly surprising. Uh, but this kind of data is really useful for us in monitoring, um, and especially as we're expanding our active management activities uh, from just Gwens Falls Leakin Park and sit going citywide. Uh, it will be really useful to see where we have opportunities to intervene very early when a species hasn't uh, fully you know, launched up that invasion curve. Okay, so what are the species that we want to look at this time of year? Uh, Megan and I are going to go through a, a number of species uh, here towards the end of the, the talk here. Um, and two of them are on this slide. You know, black fountain grass is one, it used to be called uh, penistem, and, and the, the genus is named Tachinkris, uh recently in the last year or so. Um, and this one, you can go out and see this right now. I think this photograph was taken down along the canal, like near Fletcher's Boathouse. Uh, it's very common along the canal now. And then, like I said, uh, you could probably walk around any new development and see the species being planted. Uh, it's really spreading rapidly. 
Um, be, I think in large part because the seed pressure is just so high, it's being planted everywhere and it produces a ton of seeds every year. Uh, it's a perennial plant and it's got these really interesting black, uh, black or purple looking uh, seed heads. Um, and it's in the sandburr group in, of the grasses, which I, I think is interesting. So if you ever get sandburrs down in, if you go on the outer banks or something, the species is related to those. Uh, and then also one that we're tracking is Liriope muscari. Um, the other species that's really common is the Liriope spicata, and that one is well known to spread, spread through runners. Um, and if you see uh, a Liriope in a natural area, it's probably spicata. Uh, it's well, I think it's well beyond the EDRR uh, early detection stage. But the, the muscari doesn't seem to spread as much by runners and it's spreading by seed. Uh, you'll occasionally see clumps of it or large groups of it, um, but it, it's, more, it's more on the bottom end of the curve. Uh, so it's definitely one that we're tracking and trying to deal with. Um, so holly olive, this is also called false holly. Uh, this is a species that we're, uh, it's a woody, woody plant species. It has very dark, you know, it, it's got very dark leaves that look like a holly leaf. Uh, but to me, the difference is a holly leaf is an oval or ovate leaf that has spines on the leaf uh, margins. This is more of a lobed leaf uh, that has, you know, those spines at the ends of the lobes. They're usually quite a bit smaller than holly, uh, the American holly, and they're also, um, they're also, I think, darker than American holly. Um, and then Nandina, heavenly bamboo. This is another one that is, uh, it, it's, it's fairly invasive farther south and it's more likely to, you know, as our weather, our climate changes, I think this one is more likely to become, to show more and more invasive tendencies. Uh, I actually just saw some in the Greenbelt Forest Preserve this weekend growing right on the forest edge, uh, probably put down, uh, you know, as uh, by, you know, seeds from, from bird feces because I don't know how else it would have gotten there. Um, so this one is definitely spreading by seed. Um, it's been, uh, there's been some studies that show it might be toxic to, uh, to birds if they eat enough of the seeds, uh, but I think that hasn't necessarily been confirmed with other studies yet. Uh, but these are definitely two that we are tracking and trying to get our partners to manage. And then Italian Arum. I was just looking at the uh, the entries for iNaturalist for this one, the recent entries, because I wanted to make sure this one is green right now, and it'll be green all through the winter and well into the spring. Uh, and this is a you know an, an arum from the from Europe, and it's pr fairly easy to identify because these it's uh, almost always has these highly variegated leaves, um, and then it comes up with a a typical arum type. Uh, flower with a spadix and a spathe. I think are those the right words? <laughs> uh, and a white, uh, the white um, flower, and then it gets really uh, bright red, uh, orange or scarlet uh, seeds in the late summer. Uh, so the foliage will die back, and the seed basically the seeds will be there, and then almost immediately the foliage starts growing again. There's a look like here. This is spotted arum. Uh, some people might think that it's uh, it, when the see, you see the, the the fruit head, it might look similar to a Jack in the Pulpit, um, but usually they're quite a bit larger than the Jack in the Pulpit seed heads. Uh, and then I've mentioned this one before, but leatherleaf mahonia, this one is uh, you know fairly common, commonly planted in in new developments and in the by the horticultural industry, um, and then occasionally you'll see it growing wild. It produces tons of seed. Uh, and then one of the things that we were lo really looking for is trying to get out and look for seedlings uh, to show that this species is definitely naturalizing. Uh, and de within DC, I've, I've found seedlings well into the deep forest. So I think it's definitely being spread by seed, being spread by birds. Um, and it's one that I know that Rock Creek Park is really taking seriously and trying to get get them out at the seedling stage instead of letting it get to a full grown, uh, a full grown shrub that is uh, producing seeds. Uh, so here's one that I am sadly familiar with, uh, black jet bead, uh, rototypo scandens. 
So uh, we're getting into the stage, um, you know, we might be kind of in between where it's starting to drop leaves right around now. It tends to drop them pretty late in the season, but frequently you'll find uh, that the fruits are persistent through the winter. So, uh, you know, in the spring, it's a, you know, puts on a, a lovely flower. It is in the rose family, which is interesting because the leaves are oppositely arranged which the first time I encountered this in the field, I was very confused by that. And I don't think I keyed it out successfully the first time. Uh, if you do see it with the leaves on, uh, they are again, oppositely arranged. It's a shrub with arching branches. Um, so given the serrate margins, it kind of looks to me like a, a bit like a weird viburnum almost. Uh, but in the spring, the flowers are a bit more um, reminiscent of a dogwood. So large, lovely flowers, white, about a, an inch or so in diameter, that develop into these clusters of glossy black beads that give it the common name. So bird dispersed uh, can be you know, thicket forming. Uh, there is a large population of this one in Druid Hill Park that at this point we are working on containment. So we are addressing it, um, especially when we find it in other uh, forested natural areas beyond Druid Hill. Um, again, that question of scale as to what constitutes an early detection species uh, is definitely applicable for us because this is covering a few acres. Um, we may start trying to you know, shrink the edges of that population gradually, but observations of this one are very useful, um, especially when you can find a small population before it gets well established. Another one that we've been keeping an eye on and have been getting quite a few observations of is trifoliate orange, citrus trifoliata. Uh, very distinct, um, especially in winter. Um, it is deciduous, but that you know, complex branching, thorning thicket of an appearance, um, and especially if the fruits are on, that's a pretty great indicator that that's what you're dealing with. Um, so we have been noticing this one increasingly naturalizing and uh, if it is in a, a stand that we are actively managing, we'll absolutely treat it. And we're still in the process of assessing whether it's something that we would um, you know, set out more resources to try to target uh, more preemptively. Another species that is uh, good for identifying in the winter is cutleaf blackberry. So this is one of the evergreen blackberries. I believe evergreen blackberry is one of its common names. So this will retain foliage through the winter uh, and the foliage is really distinct. So uh, a lot of our rubuses can be kind of tough to distinguish from one another, but the fact that it's, uh, you know, has leaves on in winter is a, a good key, but also the shape of the leaves is very distinct with uh, very sharp, deep incisions around the margin of the leaf. Um, so I think both of these photos were taken uh, earlier in the season. So the flower was, the flowering photo was taken maybe late May, um, and the photo on the right was from probably late summer, if I'm recalling correctly, but it will retain this appearance through into the winter season. And one that's starting to lose its leaves right around now uh, is just a species that I'm encouraging folks to keep on their radar because it tends to form extremely dense thickets, um, and I've seen grow uh, in very dense clusters uh, in a couple of locations now is five-fingered Aurelia. Uh, it is in the Aureliaceae, but the genus is Eleutherococcus. Uh, it's Seaboldianus for the specific epithet on that. Uh, from a distance, it kind of looks like a funky Virginia creeper on a shrub, but as you get in closer, uh, there are pairs of thorns uh, at the bases of the leaves. Uh, and if you find it um, you know, during the flowering period, uh, it has that very distinct um, round flowering head that uh, might tip you toward the Aureliaceae as a suspect. But the, the thorny leaves and stems um, and the, you know, the palmately compound leaves there, uh, I think it has a pretty distinct look once you get the hang of it. But again, a concern for us because we found it growing uh, in some very dense populations that really are excluding everything else. So it's it's on the level of a, uh, a multiflora rose in terms of unpleasantness to try to work in as well. So we've treated one population in Druid Hill Park uh, that it didn't respond well to the treatment uh, that I found listed. It's been addressed previously by 
some invasive strike teams in New Jersey that had some documentation on it. But otherwise, I haven't seen a ton of information on it. So if, if folks have fact sheets or info that they want to share, I'm all ears. Uh, but we will be assessing treatment options for this one going forward and uh, trying to keep this one reined in. So what's all the point of this is to get you all to come and become uh, invader detectives. Uh, so, you know, how you can help is to get the iNaturalist app, app. And then whenever you're out botanizing, you know, look for some of these EDR species and report them and record your observations. And then you'll probably get a, a message from Sarah Tangren or Mary Travellini or me or a number of other people, uh, depending on what species that you uh, that you reported. Um, so we encourage you to get that. And then also to join a listserv. So we put together a listserv. Um, and so we uh, put out seasonally appropriate species info, like this incredible one pager that Sarah Tangren had put together on how to identify uh, incised fume wart, uh, and even with a comparison to the native critalis that's in our area. Um, and then we have, you know, people just ask questions, uh, thoughts and questions and observations, and then we'll, we'll announce events as well on that. So if you want to join that, you can send me an email and just put listserv in the subject line um, and I'll respond to you and get you joining that. It's a Google group uh, if you ever use Google groups. You can also find it just by searching for invader detectives in Google groups if you use that. Uh, just we wanted to thank Sarah Tangren. Uh, she's been our, she had been the uh, coordinator for the PRISM for a long time and most of this presentation is her presentation that she had put together. Um, and um, Hopefully she'll be coming back to us. We're, the, the PRISM is actually going to start up as a program within the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, also known as COG, very soon. So hopefully we'll have Sarah back as our coordinator for this, uh, for the National Capital PRISM. So thank you. If there's any questions, we can take questions. Yeah, thanks everyone. And of course, uh, our contact info is on this slide as well. So if you have uh, follow ups after the presentation's done, uh, we definitely welcome you to get in touch. Let's start out with Lynn Parsons. Hi there. Uh, I'm just curious um, if we identify these species with the iNaturalist app, are they automatically being added to the project or do we need to do something? That's question one. Question two, as you mentioned, that you can add things to um, the observations that are that are cultivated. If we are finding, um, say, people's yards that are right on the border of the parks, is is that helpful, or is it not really anything you're going to be collecting data on? Um, sure. So, as to your first question, any any of our target species. If you report it and it's within the boundary of our project, uh, then it will be added to the project automatically by iNaturalist. And that's something that, so you don't have to join the project uh, in iNaturalist in order for your observations to be added to the project. Um, so what is the, uh, I just joined because I thought there might be something good in it. Should I do that or or, or are there only certain people that should no, be? No, it's fine. It's absolutely fine for you to, to join the project. Yeah, okay. it's open to anyone to be to join it. I, if you want to be involved as an invader detective, and you know have the contacts uh, and be a, it's better to be a member of the listserv. Uh, we do more uh, uh, outreach through the listserv than than on the project page in in iNaturalist. Um, and then yeah, I think it's important to report, uh, especially these EDRR species. I think it's important to report report them wherever they're found uh, and especially in places where it's planted by someone but it's really close to the park uh, really close to a natural area um, we just had an instance uh, along Glover Archibald Park in DC which is the National Park Service unit uh, and some folks had actually planted uh, essentially in the park they planted black fountain grass uh, along which it seems like it's the right of way next to a sidewalk but it's really uh, in the park, and this was just neighbors trying to beautify their space, uh, but they planted, they really planted the wrong plant. 
Um, there was a, I think there were three different EDRR species that they planted in the same location. So, you know, the, the National Park Service is trying to figure out how to respond to that because um, they don't want to be bad neighbors, but their neighbors are also being bad neighbors by planting invasives. Yeah, we've we've had some very similar cases, um, both people planting directly onto parks properties, again, with black fountain grass in this case, uh, and in another location, uh, there was an area where it was in the right of way and some neighbors getting a little uh, over enthusiastic with the gardening, I think. And so we ended up with Nandina and a couple of other things planted in that area. So yeah, reporting is great. Um, it's, if nothing else, uh, it can be informative as to uh, putting it on our radar to either open up a discussion with the neighbor and see if it's something they're amenable to removing. Um, in our program, you know, we have our Tree Baltimore partners where we do a lot of tree giveaways. So there may be cases where we can talk someone into removing an undesirable species and we can provide them with a free replacement that's appropriate for the space. Um, but also just for long-term monitoring, if we know that there's going to be a seed source, uh, it can be a, a valuable piece of information for us to have. And Bauer. Thanks. So great, great presentation. Um, as long as we're talking about non-native invasives, uh, stream restorations like the one behind me are really, aside from the fact that they, in many cases, clear-cut repairing areas, they really create uh, highways for non-native invasives to get deep into the uh, into forests and natural areas. Um, Baltimore City has a proposed project in Herring Run for a so-called stream restoration. Chesapeake Bay Foundation has come out strongly against it. So my question to Megan is, when's, when's the city of Baltimore gonna pull the plug on that uh, really destructive product project? Uh, I'm hoping that we have good news in the near future. Um, I, I certainly agree that uh, the way that these projects are conducted uh, is completely antithetical to the goals that they're espousing. Um, I'm saying that, I'll clarify, uh, I, that is my opinion as a private individual <laughs> and not as a representative, et cetera. Um, but yeah, we, we are hopeful that the, uh, you know, uh, the amount of opposition that we've received to this project might lead to some folks that have the uh, capability for pulling relevant plugs to, to rethink that approach. Um, and we are certainly advocating for, uh, you know, not defaulting to stream restoration as the be all and end all of ways to, to meet our MS4 obligations. Um, for projects that we do, uh, that are carried out, we are also advocating for um, you know, mandating a commitment from our partners for integrated vegetation management um, you know, in the follow-up rather than just leaving the disturbed area to uh, you know, do what it will, which is often enough revert to porcelain berry and Lord knows what else. So we are uh, advocating for uh, better practices and for us to be better stewards of our public lands. I'm glad to hear that. If things don't work out for you up in Baltimore, please come down to Montgomery County because we've got a um, really terrible record of doing these stream restorations down here. Thanks. Jill, did you want to go next? Yeah, great talk. I really enjoyed it. I uh, have known about this invader detectors thing for a little while because I worked with Mark at the Park Service. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask is how does your data um, mesh with the early detection distribution mapping system that uh, I, that's the one that I've been using for a long time that was developed through University of Georgia. And um, like, for example, um, and it came along long time before the invader detectors did, and it's kind of doing the same thing, but invader detectors is using iNaturalist um, Ed Maps, the other one is using, you know, its own system and it's uh, nationally used. Um, and for example, like five leaf Akibia, I reported that back in 2009 along the MacArthur Boulevard area, um, Italian Arum. I mean, there's a whole bunch of these early detection uh, species that I or someone else I know has reported using Ed Maps as far as ED 
D E D R R goes. So how do how do you um, get the data? I know EdMaps will get data from um, from iNaturalist, but I don't know if it's a two way street. So can you clarify that? Yeah, um, at least for us, I don't I don't think that um, I don't think that iNaturalist pulls data from EdMaps. So I think it's just right now a one way street. Um, and we, what I do is use EdMaps. Uh, we we figured that it it seemed we tried using EdMaps and it was more uh, cumbersome and more we thought it'd be more difficult for people to for volunteers to use. So that's why we went with iNaturalist. Um, we also saw that iNaturalist had a, you know just a ton more users than EdMaps. Um, so what we're doing, at least within DC, and I think a lot of our partners are just also pulling information from MedMaps on these species that are our target species. Um, so occasionally I'll go in and look and see if there's anything, uh, anything new for Italian added to it for Italian Arum. Um, or if I'm collecting data uh, for a specific project where I know that I want, um, where I know that I want really, you know, well, more well curated or better curated data, then I'll use EdMaps to get that. Um, um, do you coordinate that with Chuck Bargeron, or because that seems like maybe a more efficient way to do it? You know, to ask him if you have a list of a dozen species, ask him to send all the data. We actually did that a little bit with the exotic plant management team with Mark Frey and the team over there early on. Um, that was you know, it's been a little while, a decade. But we tried to to make sure there was a way that there weren't two things going on and not combining data because obviously everybody wants all of the most data possible when you're reporting these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't talked to Chuck yet about that, but I I that's a good idea. I should I should get that should be something that our little subcommittee for early detection talks about and make sure that we integrate these two databases. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good job. Good. I needed I needed something for an agenda for our subcommittee meeting. Oh, good. <laughs> in the in the winter time. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. We okay, do have thanks. a comment from Caro Frost in the chat saying that EdMaps and iNaturalist do talk to each other. Um, Mike Littman, you are next. Great. Hi. Thanks, guys. Really good presentation. Enjoyed it. Um, I'm actually in Loudoun County, Virginia. And I had a question. I was looking, Damien, at the map for your prism. And I say your, because um, in Loudon, it's funny, I guess I'm part of Blue Ridge prism. And I noticed Fairfax is part of uh, the DC region prism. And right now we've got a, a, an initiative going that's that's got a lot of traction. We're actually, I'm actually meeting with the chair of the board of supervisors tomorrow. They've approved some, it looks like they're gonna approve some funding to research uh, to how we might tackle invasives in, in the county. Um, Fairfax is trying to do something similar. So we're talking with, I'm talking with Fairfax now to try to figure out, okay, how can we work together to get our, our local governments to help us with this? Um, but I see the two different prisms. So I guess my question is, do you guys work well with Blue Ridge Prism? Because I know they're also, they have a conference in a couple of weeks down in Charlottesville uh, to do some strategic planning around how to, get help from the state. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how you guys work together because I'm working with Fairfax, but I want the prisms working together too. So hopefully you can shed some light there. Um, yeah, you know, we haven't really, we've, we haven't really worked with Blue Ridge Prism much as a prism. I've worked, done a lot of with, with Blue Ridge Prism um, and when I wear different hats, like with the Mid-Atlantic Invasive Plant Council. Um, and I've also done some work with, there was at one point, there was a prism starting to form on the Eastern shore, uh, or at least I think they call themselves a cooperative weed management area. Um, but yeah, I think I think it would be a good idea for some of these regional prisms to get, to get together and talk about our priorities and how we can do things like get the states to give us funding. And, um, the, the, you know, especially with things like, uh, this Trapa bispinosa, which really just exploded. I mean, it was first found in Northern Virginia in Fairfax County and rapidly found in many more uh, ponds. 
And then all of a sudden it was found, I think down in Caroline County, whatever county is outside of Richmond last year. Uh, and then found here on in Maryland, real close to, to where I live in Beltsville Agricultural Research Center. So it, it seems like it's been around longer than we think. Um, either that or it's just been spread a lot more quickly uh, than we even could have guessed. Uh, and so in those cases, yeah, we definitely need um, all of these uh, partners at all levels of partnership and at all levels of government to be to be working together um, to deal with things like that, where they just kind of they just take off. Lauren, uh, you can go ahead next. Hi there. Um, yeah, this was amazing work. I'm really excited about it. As a weed warrior, I'm wondering how how all this trickles down to those of us on the ground. And I and I can also say that you know I've observed like wavy basket grass swept through the park behind my house in the last three years, and I felt rather helpless, you know, because. I can't, I can't handle it. Like it's too big for me. And yet if I report it, I don't feel like it necessarily gets picked up in a quick way. So I'm wondering if you have advice on how to possibly elevate a situation like that, where you, you can see it coming and you can't stop it. Yeah, that's a tricky question and uh, a difficult position to, to be in. I think, um, you know, you're. I think you're coming from a different perspective than a lot of our volunteers, and that you're you have uh, you know a great deal of expertise in the field, and uh, many of our volunteers do, but not all. And so, I think uh, a lot of our training actually um, is we start off by horrifying them. We you know, we take them into really disturbed areas, and and things do look kind of out of control. So, um, I th I suppose a lot of it is just finding a strong match uh, in terms of you know, the priorities that you're identifying on the ground, um, you know, and where it fits with the priorities of the responsible landowner. Um, so, you know, where you have inroads to, to raise those kind of, of issues, that's always beneficial. Um, you know, I know that we certainly can't get to all of the populations that our volunteers would like us to. Um, and so, we try to be as transparent as we can about the resource limitations that we're up against and how we are uh, prioritizing you know, the locations that we're working in or the strategies that we're taking. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a tough nut to crack. So I'm, so I'm thinking what, what I'm hearing really and what I already know is that this whole situation is under-resourced financially. It simply is, we're just being overrun and, we're not really funding it appropriately. So I guess that's another um, aspect of this, which, you know, Judy talked about earlier and, 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 and uh, um, uh, Michael also talked, you know, there's efforts to do something about this, but it is a big problem. So, mm -hmm. all right, thanks. <laughs> Mark, do you want to go ahead and? Yes, uh, first on wavy leaf basket grass, there is one good news. The good news is the first year it pops up. If you remove it, it does not come back, okay? So like when it first appeared in your backyard, if you'd gotten it right away, it wouldn't be back unless it came in from the outside. Now, the other thing I wanted to say is that we'll talk with Chuck Barger on a year ago. You know how this uh, new native is popping up and killing uh, garlic mustard in the center of Montgomery County? Anyhow, he has agreed that he would like to have a, a, a section, I think you put it in, everybody can report when a new biological troll appears to be popping up, where there's no other explanation and suddenly an invasive species, a large amount of it disappears. And that becomes the basis for further research, looking for a native biological control or some non-native that might count as a good biological control. The third thing I wanted to mention is that my, I have limited resources, so all I have time to take care of is a 200 acre Earth B. Swan Park. And I take, can't take care of it because I've kept up on it. Uh, but when trifoliate orange appeared, I got rid of it and it never came back. When uh, Boston Ivy appeared, I got rid of it and never came back. When wavy leaf pops up, I get rid of it, it doesn't come back. So that ADRR is a real good solution. 
Yeah, thanks, Mark. And we've had some success with getting um, some isolated populations of wavy leaf basket grass under control. Um, we've uh, tapped into working with more partners, which I think a lot of, uh, you know, what we what things really come down to is getting the best information that you can, which is where a lot of our volunteers come in, but also building relationships wherever you can. So um, thankfully, we are uh, working on building a, a good relationship with our neighbors who are enthusiastic about disc golf. Um, so we believe that uh, some wavy leaf basket grass seeds have been hitchhiking around with those folks, but uh, you know they are willing to show up to volunteer days when we host them to help maintain their courses. So, um, so yeah, wavy leaf it can be a fun one to remove. Like it's you know you kind of get that that zipper effect going as you pull those runners and as long as you're getting the root system out. Um, we have uh, in some of the areas where we had some uh, volunteer events, we have definitely noticed a local uh, reduction in that population. But you know that's a, a different beast versus um, when you're dealing with a couple acres of it. So uh, part of it is choosing your battles. One of the things that we focus on in our uh, Weed Warriors training is uh, you know, assessing a population for control and uh, when you can be effective because we want to make sure that when people are lending us their time that we use it well and that they get to see success stories on the ground. We have one question from Michael Wilpers uh, asking, uh, at this point, should we report all cases of Italian arm that we find? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, we're still uh, hoping to, especially in some parks where it's rare, hoping to do the rapid response and, and either, you know, and get folks at uh, parks to respond and deal with it. It is a difficult one to, to manage. Uh, you can't really do it with mechanical control and you can't really do it with chemical control either. So it's um, it's it's a difficult one to manage, but we do want to uh, try to get parks to respond to new populations uh, that are you know, that are isolated and where it's pretty rare. Yeah. So uh, we also have a question from Kathy Daniel. Um, she says that she reported on iNaturalist uh, five-leafed akebia uh, in the uh, Sino Canal Park near Lock 5. And she also reported a smaller infestation near Lock 6. So she, I guess she's just kind of wondering if uh, anything has been done or if, if people are planning to do anything about those infestations. Um, I don't know. I think that... Uh... I could check on the um, look for those populations on iNaturalist and let let the Park Service's invasive plant management team know that it's there. Um, it could be I'm not sure. It could be it, if it's along MacArthur Boulevard. It might be um, Montgomery County Parks as well. I think one side on some part along MacArthur. I think there is some Montgomery County Park units. Uh, but then I think on the on the west side or the the, the river side, that's all National Park Service. Um, so I can look for it and um, and try to get someone to respond to it. Is it a large population? I'm not sure. I've only seen I haven't seen huge stands. I've seen stands where it's maybe at most five feet by five feet or maybe ten by ten, but I haven't seen anything any really large stands of it. Thinking again about, I was thinking of Aurelia, and you you wrote Akebia. Uh, there is a very large population of five leaf Akebia um, along the Clara Barton Parkway, just as you go from DC into Maryland. Uh, pretty much the entire uh, hillside along that stretch between the Capitol Crescent Trail and Canal Road would become, and that becomes Clara Barton Parkway at um, at uh, Chain Bridge, it's very prevalent through the forest there. And it is also down, it's definitely down in the floodplain uh, along the flats under the Chain Bridge. So it, it's a fairly large population of that vine down there. Is there any plan by the Park Service to do something about it? I don't think so. I think they have, uh, they have other priorities throughout the region. And then they're the, the, the team that manages invasive plants for the National Park Service in the region, um, they're essentially assigned uh, places and, 
and populations to manage by each individual park. Um, so I think the CNO, CNO Canal Park has other priorities. Um, for instance, Black Fountain Grass, I know they've been treating Black Fountain Grass along the, along the towpath and along the floodplain. Um, so that's definitely one that they're trying to manage before it becomes too unmanageable. Um, okay. that, that population of Ikebia is very large. It's probably three to five acres in size. It's really huge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's enormous. <laughs> Uh, we have a, a similar question from two different people. Uh, Cynthia Poole and Lee Growl are both wondering, are there any PRISM units up in Harford County? Um, and Cynthia asked about Frederick County, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know about Harford. I guess Megan would have to talk about maybe they'll think about spreading and creating a PRISM uh, in the, the Baltimore area. Frederick County, uh, potentially we could bring Frederick County into the National Capital Prism. Uh, I think Frederick County is a part of COG. Uh, so the COG has a certain membership and uh, of municipalities and counties in the area. And so I think if Frederick County is a member of COG, it's likely that we would expand the Prism eventually to include all of COG, uh, all of the area that COG covers. But right now we haven't, um, we don't necessarily have the resources to, to be expanding yet. Um, so for now, the answer is no for Frederick County. Yeah, and we've, uh, we've had some discussions with some of our uh, neighboring jurisdictions to gauge uh, interest and commitment level for taking on something like a PRISM. And um, it's certainly useful for us to at least check in with our neighbors informally because it gives us a great opportunity to compare notes and uh, and have some of those exchanges. But at this time, I don't think anyone has the bandwidth to uh, to run the show. But um, long term, we would love to see that come to fruition for a, a Baltimore area prism. Oh, same response for Howard County. I see a question about Howard mm -hmm. County too. That might be one where it's like, which prism would it would Howard County join if it were to you know, would it be a Baltimore based one or uh, a DC based one? So um, yeah, I think the question on who the appropriate person to be would, uh, I'm not sure if there's a county park system in Howard County, you know, if you, you could talk to them and learn about what Howard County is doing to manage invasives and then encourage them to get in touch with me or, or with Megan and then you know, hopefully you could work at the, the county could work out a, a partnership or or someone at the county could decide that they want to partner with us and, and join or, or partner with Megan and I try to get something going in, in the in the Baltimore area. Yeah, they're they're one of the groups that we've uh, had some discussions with, although off the top of my head, I don't recall um, how much of the scope of Howard County we had involved in that discussion. Um, that's one where you have uh, a pretty complex patchwork of, of land management, um, since you have, um, you know, things like the uh, uh, Patapsco State Park, as well as the county level and uh, Columbia with the, the uh, trail system and the, the vegetation um, around the, uh, the community association. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if we had everyone we needed uh, to be in the chat on that one uh, looped in, but yeah, we'd be happy to connect with them in the future as well. All right, I'm going to say thank you so much. This was a really great presentation. I appreciate what you guys are doing and gives me some hope that, you know, maybe we'll make some inroads. Um, and uh, Judy, do you want to jump in here and say anything since you, you uh, organized this talk? And I appreciate you for doing that. Uh, I think it was a, a great talk, and uh, again, uh, people can uh, uh, look out for the uh, field trip that Megan Carr is uh, running, and just as a side comment on the various questions, I really hope that uh, sometime in the not-too-distant future, we do get a uh, 
Baltimore and uh, neighboring areas PRISM because I think that would be a terrific idea and there can be great power in a PRISM. So uh, thank you very much, Damien and Megan. Uh, again, excellent presentation and uh, you're doing great job with uh, your respective areas. It was a real pleasure. Thanks so much for having us. And yeah, hope to see lots of folks uh, out to stroll with me. And my excellent colleague, Ashley Bowers, uh, was not able to attend tonight, but she is amazing and will uh, add uh, an enormous wealth of knowledge to our stroll in Druid Hill Park. So please come out. Great. Okay. And everybody needs to go out and report invasives, right? <laughs> yep. Yes. yes. <laughs> Get out your... <laughs> I definitely am going to up my game knowing that somebody's looking. That's exciting, you know. All right. Thank you right. so much. Thank you. All right, thank you.